you can go to therapy four times a week for 40 years and get all the insights in the universe about why you are like you are, your wounds and your traumas, and not necessarily change a thing. Right, it seems to me that anyone who understands the healing properties of these things yeah. is, is on board with it. It's not that we grow despite trauma. We grow specifically because of trauma. The healing really comes about through the, the mystical experience trauma you know, with a small t we all experience in the west in many ways because we just brought up without the ability to value and be connected with our emotions welcome to the in search of more podcast i am your host ellie nash join me weekly on my quest for more more from myself and more from this world we'll see you on the other side all right so i'm sitting here with yoki Ress. how are you yoki welcome thank you so much welcome Pleasure to, to the here. other Welcome to the side of the world. Thank you. So Yoki is a psychologist, a um, musician, and uh, a Hasidic psychonaut. That's it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> where do we start first? I don't know if the camera's uh, catching all of it, but for those just uh, listening, we have in front of us um, sound bowls and other sort of uh, weapons of mass construction, as you've called it. So uh, where do we want to start? Let's talk about the uh, Hasidic psychonaut. Where did the shirt? How did the shirt come about? So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a, a real. I count it as one of the most precious blessings in my life, uh, besides my wife and kids and family and special community in South Africa. But uh, to have this incredible group of friends, really just such authentic souls, able to hold space for each other. Um, I regard them as wizards in many ways. They're just really magical, special human beings. And we all bound by this common love for experience and authenticity and uh, exploration and adventure and mystery and a connection with, in some way, a connection with Hasidic teachings and Kabbalah. So the name that manifested for us was uh, the Hasidic <laughs> psychonauts, Hasidic psychonauts. <laughs> And uh, I sometimes call myself a Hasidelic Jew. And uh, this shirt, this emblem was, was chosen. Um, it's got a, you know, psychonaut has the connotation of someone who explores inner space rather than just outer space. And um, we chose this sort of uh, this uh, image. And my daughter, who's an incredibly gifted artist, she's 17 and a half now, in her final year of school, she hand drew this uh, Beautiful. on the shirt. So I thought it was a good shirt to wear for today. Yeah, definitely very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So let's jump into some of the work you're doing with MAPS. MAPS is, they're on the forefront of the MDMA research and using MDMA in a healing uh, capacity. They've hired you for some things. So can you talk about what you're doing for them? Yeah. And um, more about what they're doing. Sure. Thanks. So that's one of the main reasons why I was able to come out and I, I came out for the MAPS Psychedelic Science 2023 conference that was held last week in Denver. Uh, it was an incredible week-long event, uh, 12,000 people from all over the world in all different disciplines. And uh, I was very blessed as part of my research with them that I do remotely from South Africa. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what that is in a moment um, to be part sponsored to come out and to attend that incredibly uh, life-changing event in many ways. And um, so the, the research work that I do with them, uh, as a clinical psychologist, I was very blessed to get an opportunity to um, see an advert that was, I actually didn't see it, a friend of mine saw it, I don't go much on Facebook, but a friend of mine saw this advert and sent it to me. Uh, they were looking for mental health professionals uh, to be involved in a role that's called an adherence rater. So an adherence rater is, um, it can be done remotely because they send videos, video recordings of the uh, sessions in the trials so there's three phases of uh, the the sessions there's the preparation sessions there's the experimental sessions which is the dosing which could be placebo because it's double blind controlled trials and those are the seven eight hour long ones of preparation and the integration the last um, phase uh, are more shorter an hour hour and a half usually and so my role as an adherence rater we were trained for about six months about 50 something hours by maps is to watch these videos and with each participant who's having these sessions, 
um, there's two therapists. There's a therapy pair. It's really important to have uh, sometimes a diverse, uh, you know, male and female, different cultures is really helpful, especially in trauma in case of something. In happens. all three parts of the process? There's in all two. three parts of the process for safety and just the ideal kind of um, therapy resources is uh, with trauma, it's good to have more than just one type of person and, and uh, it's, it's very resource heavy, but for the trials and for the FDA approval, they really uh, were, were strong on that. And my role is to watch and rate how well this therapy pair keeps to the um, the, the framework and the, the the methodology, the approach of how the medicine should be given and the therapy should be given, and that approach based on maps. Yeah, so so there's a couple, uh, Michael and Anne Matofo, who who uh, are the ones who developed. She's a psychiatrist. She's a psychiatric nurse. Um, they married and, and uh, they developed the protocol for this MDMA therapy. And what's so fascinating about it is that this approach to giving therapy and, and this medicine and, and the psychotherapy that goes with it is a radical shift and almost inversion and flip from the traditional uh, approach in psychiatry because the whole approach is based on respecting the innate healing intelligence and wisdom of the person and the participant and empowering them to connect with the innate healing ability. And that agency and that empowerment is so crucial in trauma because trauma, the effects of trauma are so disempowering. People are stuck. People are stuck in this bubble that they can't get out of and can't shake out of. And so it's just such an incredible thing because even you know, in psychiatry, certainly um, the reliance and on the, 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 the medication model, the pharmaceuticals for long term can be quite uh, disempowering and creating a narrative of, of dependence and, and that the person is not able to achieve healing on their own. And there's been some research that came out quite recently uh, around how much less effective the antidepressant medications are. The story that was sold to the public by the psychiatry discipline for decades, that it's a chemical imbalance in the brain and that it needs long-term you know, dependence on these medicines has been shown to not have any validity, actually. And which part of it doesn't have validity, the chemical imbalance or the fact that these substances will work? Well, what's been shown is that there's no actual proof uh, from for the the chemical imbalance aspect, the way that it's been uh, you know articulated and, and and said for so many decades. And it's also been shown that there can be effectiveness for the psychiatric medications uh, for some time, but on a more shorter term level. Once it becomes a long term dependency, it's been shown to be counterproductive and, and, and fostering a narrative of more dependence. So, so we're talking about let's say, a symptom of depression. And the suggestion based on psychiatry for many years was that there was a chemical imbalance that was right. feeding that. Right. Versus uh, what your understanding is, what is feeding that? So trauma is, and I, I see you've had Dr. Gabor Mate before, and yeah. he's well, no better expert in the world on, and his research on that. But the understanding of trauma now is, is so different. And, and the conditions like depression and anxiety are really often underpinned by a trauma experience. And trauma is much more broad than just the traditional stereotype, you know, abuse and um, crime or, or, or sort of disaster scenarios. Trauma, you know, with a small T, we all experience in the West in many ways because we just brought up without the ability to value and be connected with our emotions. And so uh, this approach in treating specific diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, so it's often with war veterans, it's often, um, I've been very blessed that I, I, I've even rated some videos in the Israel sites. My Hebrew is very good and I was able to. That was really meaningful and special. Um, but the, this is really looking at um, how someone who's suffering from exposure to trauma and is really disconnected from themselves and numb, uh, this can achieve a healing. This medicine is not given regularly at all. It's given twice or three times. The, the protocol has been up till now three doses, and they're now looking at a new research protocol to see how effective it can even be with two doses. And the staggering finding that, that came out was that from three doses, um, people were sometimes healed not just symptoms, you know, um, abated, but real healing and not qualifying for the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder for up to a year just from those three um, doses. Wait, so let's break it down a little bit. So MAPS is that—that's what they're studying—is PTSD. 
That's so, so you're saying is MDMA effective for PTSD? MDMA is, is, has been shown to be most, it, it could be effective for many other you know, psychological aspects which have, and, and conditions that have trauma underpinning it, but most particularly it's shown the most dramatic healing effects with trauma in therapy because the thing with MDMA, MDMA... Are, Can we define trauma in this context before we go to MDMA? So post-traumatic stress disorder is really um, uh, having been exposed to a serious trauma, being stuck in the trauma and re-experiencing the trauma via nightmares, flashbacks, um, together with a hyperarousal. So always feeling this kind of jack-in-the-box, uh, any noise and, and any association and any just kind of uh, uh, trigger that can bring on um, the anxiety. Uh, so is, we're not talking about it in the um, in the, the common way we may use that word. Correct. Tra tra we, that was a traumatic in, in, experience. In this case, for the trials and for the FDA approval, they're using the specific diagnostic category of post-traumatic stress disorder, and usually that's and that's a serious exposure to an incident, a war, uh, you know, context or... Um, and yeah. it's, it's physiological, physiologically measurable, what, what someone is, this level of PTSD. Right. So uh, there's a whole set of criteria in you know, the diagnostic classification systems. There's the ICD, there's the DSM. And um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's measurable in terms of the symptoms and there's questionnaires and scales that they kind of you know, measure people in terms of how they qualify for that condition. And then they use that as a baseline measurement in terms of what is the reduction in symptomatology post uh, the treatment. Okay, so we're talking about people on the higher end of the traumatic yeah, correct. scale, like correct. severe. I think I read a study, it was a number of years ago, so maybe I'm wrong, but one of the phases of the trials, they were looking at um, people with, uh, what do you call, untreatable PTSD, mm. Mm. on average suffering with, with right. the symptoms for 15 plus, right. plus right. years. And, and that's often some of the criteria in, in, in these trials where people have just not responded. Uh, re refractive, they sometimes call it um, uh, persistent PTSD that has not been responsive to the you know, traditional modalities in pharmaceutical medicine. Understood. So the theory that MAPS is operating under is that three or possibly two Right. sessions within a certain protocol which... within within the context of preparation and psychotherapy support uh, before during and after it sees what kind of um the most dramatic uh, reduction in, in, in cure of, of of symptoms for up to a year just from those those three sessions um with with the therapy as well and after a year what happens I mean, I, I don't know if they've uh, had the time frames to, to... Oh, they're not saying it to, comes back after a year, but they've been able to measure... They've just been able to measure that up to, you know, um, which is such a striking thing. I mean, there's, right. there's, there's no uh, parallel to that in a way in psychiatry where you can go so deep in a person, um, like almost surgical intervention uh, in a psychiatric, psychological way and achieve such shifts that last so long. It's just such a completely different. And the interesting thing about MDMA is that MDMA, unlike the classical psychedelics, you know, the tryptamine psychedelics like um, LSD and like psilocybin mushrooms and ayahuasca, um, MDMA is not a classic psychedelic. It's not something where a person goes out of their normal uh, uh, psyche and, and, and container and, and personality, and therefore it's not as challenging. Um, you're still in your normal mode, so to speak. It's just that your heart is opened in a gigantic way, and there's this flooding of euphoria from the serotonin flooding side and compassion um, from the oxytocin side, the bonding hormone of mother to child. And that unique mix and profile of MDMA makes it so ideal for psychotherapy. It's like engineered in the most precise, brilliant way to be able to help psychotherapy, especially for trauma. With trauma, there is so much overwhelm and anxiety to be able to even talk about the traumatic incidents and come to a new understanding or relationship with the trauma the principle is that you can't take away what's happened to you if you've suffered from trauma but at the same time the trauma doesn't have to continue to define your life and so when you connect with that deepest place in yourself your essence then you are able to have the ability to realize that even though i can't take the, away the trauma that's happened to me i can shift the meaning that it has for me and that's why internal family systems 
um, IFS uh, or parts work. Um, mm -hmm. I was very blessed to meet Richard Schwartz, one of the people that I bumped into in this conference, and had a little chat with him, and uh, he was saying how much he loves Kabbalah, because Kabbalah is really the system about connecting to our deepest part where we can reframe our narratives, and we have the ability to, to manifest our reality and change our story, the letters of our thoughts. And uh, that's really what this, the IFS is actually the chosen therapeutic frame that in the MAPS research and in the MAPS therapy is used um, because it's so aligned with this um, approach of helping to empower people to connect with their, the part that doesn't you know, define them by the narratives that they're experiencing as a result of the trauma. There's an Instagram that has this picture of a brain and this quite psychedelic sort of image and it says, if the thoughts in, in your head are you, then who's the one listening to them? So that really kind of captures quite nicely what's really going on here in this therapy. This therapy is creating the conditions and the environment with the help and the tool of the medicine, which is just a tool, but it allows the person to let go, to have compassion, to soften the grip and the hold of the impact of the trauma so that they can actually discover a part of themselves that is not needing to be defined by the trauma. So is it a, a tool for therapy or is there value in and of itself, meaning uh, many people use MDMA in a, right. a party setting. Recreational. Yeah. Recreational or party setting. Yeah. Is that, is, is that also, will that also heal trauma potentially? So, I mean, you know, just the experience of uh, certainly uh, in terms of this context and PTSD and the therapy frame uh, and structure, um, it, it, it's a different uh, picture, but that's not to say that, you know, we're all traumatized in some ways. We live in a traumatized world. Uh, Dr. Gabor's latest book, uh, The Myth of Normal, is, mm. is, is specifically touching on that. And uh, the experience of just being in that space, even if it's in a recreational uh, space, is, is very profound. So being able to connect with people, being able to achieve this connection with yourself and compassion and just love and having that flow, even if it is in a recreational uh, context, can certainly still be valuable. Absolutely. Understood. So back to the, um, the, the protocol itself, can you, can you describe it in addition to the three parts? Yeah. You mentioned the preparation, the work itself, with the medicine and then the integration afterwards what is the the length of time what else is going on there and yeah so um there's normally uh three preparation sessions before the actual uh, experimental dosing which again can be placebo what's been so amazing is that um the, the 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 group that have just had the therapy and re received the placebo but not the actual active medication by the way the sample and and, and uh, control group that receives only the placebo will still always get the opportunity to have the medicine as well afterwards um, which which is really nice of maps to and and you know the right thing to do um, but what's so amazing is the dramatic therapeutic um, shifts just from this approach so just from having therapy that um, helps take people deep into themselves and is done with the with the approach of respecting the innate healing wisdom and experience within the person and having them listen to music and be held in that kind of environment and nurturing and empowering environment they've shown dramatic improvements as well sometimes sometimes the people that have been in the control group had the placebo and had that type of therapy and then the medicine have related that the healing that they achieved in the first round just with the placebo is in some ways more powerful and shifting, which is just interesting. So there have been a lot of fascinating things that have come up in terms of understanding that these medicines are just tools. The, the healing is not done through the medicine, but it's really, um, it's really the environment and the connection that is achieved. You know, um, that's very much uh, Dr. Gabor Mate's uh, mantra. One of them, you know, that that uh, healing from sobriety is uh, healing from addiction is not sobriety; it's connection. Um, and the sobriety will come from that. And that takes, you know, also into account the incredibly powerful role of music and healing and sound, which is very much as a professional and qualified musician, um, what I work with a lot as well. So it's very special for me to be involved uh, in this research. It was you know, very humbling and such a huge blessing to be able to bring kind of two very big parts of, of my life in the psychology and music and the mystical um, side too, because they've shown in the research more with psilocybin, but that the mystical experience is um, inherently therapeutic and, and healing for our psyche. So before we go into the music, I want to drill down a little bit into the, uh, Sorry, the so, shift you're making. Yeah. So you're saying that, you know, independent of the, M of the MDMA, 
there's something about flipping therapy on its head where it's Correct. not a broken person coming to someone else for healing. Right. But here we are um, kind of facilitating someone's own self-healing capacity. Absolutely. So can you speak to what some of those ingredients are outside of the medicine that's um, facilitating enabling that? Because that sounds like that's something I can definitely get behind. It makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it yeah. resonates deeply. So, so another striking synchronicity for me and resonance on a personal level is that my thesis that I did, um, which has actually been published uh, 13 years ago, um, was actually on this whole topic. It was looking at uh, psychotherapy from a, a lens of Martin Buber's I Thou philosophy. Martin Buber was a German Jewish philosopher who had a great fascination with the Hasidic masters and saw the Hasidic masters as living their life in this like authentic, spontaneous in the moment interaction with the divine in a really soul to soul and with other human beings level. And I applied that lens and a type of very newer evolution in psychoanalysis called intersubjectivity theory, which has also turned the whole traditional approach of psychoanalysis on its head where traditionally the analyst had all the knowledge and kind of was the one and doing this analysis <coughs> and therapy to the person and intersubjectivity theory balances that out completely and says no this is a, a co-creation of an intersubjective field between two humans that's mutually influential and 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 reciprocal and um uh, both people are are effective uh, affected and growing in that in that context and so you know, for me, uh, I'm so amazed how the research has, in that sort of direction and in the psychedelic healing space, really um, moved into this flipping of uh, the power differential that's always traditionally been in the relatively very new field of psychology. It's only been around for just a little bit over a century. Right. Um, but it's really such a dramatic kind of uh, turning on its head of the traditional uh, notions of what therapy is all about. And uh, I think that we, you know, we this is really important for our world and in our time because we live in a world that is in some ways so empowering of everyone. Uh, there's so much access to knowledge and information that has never before been available, even in, uh, in, in corporate you know, spaces. A lot of the work that I've done and specialized in is, is corporate workshops and leadership development and uh, culture transformation for companies and teams. And it's so amazing to kind of see the dramatic different landscape in the world of work today, because you know, a couple of decades ago, uh, the employer had all the power and the employee had very little you know, power and access and empowerment. Today, in some ways, the employees are more technologically savvy, have more access to, they've got kind of greater empowerment. And so the world is really shifting and evolving in many ways along these lines. So it makes sense that we need to have a therapeutic approach that fits with that. So how might that, how, how might that look different than a traditional therapy session? Right, you've, you've observed many of these yeah. at this point. Yeah. So independent of the medicine, what I'm interested right. is in the environment. Is the environment yeah. and might some therapists who are listening in learn something from this in terms yeah. of their own practice yeah. with or without the medicine? Yeah. So there's a number of things. I mean, um, firstly, uh, the whole new paradigm in, in psychiatry and psychology now is the body, the somatic area. Uh, talk therapy, we've got to get out of the couch as, as some people, get off the couch as some people you know, phrase it. Um, talk therapy, it, it does not just work as effectively anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now, you know, uh, we used to, the field of psychology coaching is kind of been traditionally based on that if you create greater insights, that will translate into behavioral change. We now know that that's not necessarily the case at all. You can go to therapy four times a week for 40 years and get all the insights in the universe about why you are like you are and your wounds and your traumas and not necessarily change a thing. But when you take it to the realm of action and stretching and connecting and trying new things out, atomic habits, um, being connected in the body, using the body as a source of information, intuition, there's so much research now about the gut. The gut is a second brain. It's the enteric nervous system. And so um, this is really where everything is at. The famous book by Dr. Bessel van Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, so really the whole therapeutic approach in many ways is also aligned with this new focus on the body and the somatic approaches so the whole environment is is really um, created in a very warm intimate uh, you know there's art there are plants uh, there is a, a bed or couch where the person is able to lie down go into themselves with the help of headphones and um, playing you know special curated music that's really suitable to 
with different frequencies and vibrations that kind of takes people into mm -hmm. their bodies and has different emotional you know moods and soundscapes that can evoke different textures and emotional qualities there's eye shades that help people go you know inside more and so the whole therapy is really just set up in the and the environment in such a way and the therapists are inviting and suggesting so they're not telling they're not interpreting they are just curious and they're trying to invite the participants to be curious about their own experience. They will ask things like, what's happening in your body now as you're speaking about that? Where do you feel that? They'll give them time to go inside their body and experience where they and, and what they're feeling internally. And, and then if the person wants to, you know, we'll speak about it afterwards. So everything is really kind of um, underpinned by, by this new approach in terms of internal connecting and healing and working with the body. Fascinating. <clears throat> yeah, definitely um, matches as someone who's matches my own experiences as someone who started in talk therapy, but then having that punctuated um, by EMDR therapy, yeah. therapy, and yeah. finding a lot more healing in those mm. infrequent sessions than I was in the longer, right? You know, right. a lot of talking and a lot right. of understanding, and not that it wasn't helpful, right? But it only achieves those certain, dramatic shifts. Yeah, there's only so much that you can achieve from. From the inside. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And then I, I talk about it a lot. My wife and I did a couple um, of experiences with this woman, Hadi Schleifer. Oh, wow. I've actually been uh, in, in, in person and she just lost her husband. Yes, sadly, exactly. Recently. Yeah. Yes, I, I was blessed when she came out to South Africa. I mean, it's such a synchronicity because she's um, a specialist in not only the Imago and the Jungian and the and the neuro kind of science stuff, but in the I thou Martin Buber's I thou oh, right. one, one of her core yeah. yes uh, <laughs> theoretical you know foundations. So there was such a resonance with her. And what a beautiful human being! So. Amazing, amazing. So what was neat about it was just how she kind of stepped out of the way of the healing and really was there to facilitate right. the couple's. Um, I don't want to call it healing. The couple's connection. Connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's was amazing. a fascinating, That's fascinating amazing. experience. Such and those, I, I've been to a number of her workshops. I'm a big fan. So when she was down in Miami a few times, I've a speaking workshop, a relationship workshop. But mm. my wife and I did two of her um, intensives. Mm. One before we got engaged and one, um, it was like a wow. month before COVID after wow. we were married with a kid. What a blessing. To amazing. You. She works with this kind of resonance field and kind of being in a certain proximity and what happens on a neurological wiring level when you... When you uh, connect in, in that sort of way. Yeah, one uh, my the first experience I did with her was before any psychedelic experience. Mm. The second one was after. Was after. Wow. Um, and um, I, the the only way I've described it is it's the closest thing to a journey I've ever experienced. Right. Before a journey was right. was the work with with her. It's so experiential. Yeah, and transformative. Yeah. You come out of there. You know, complete, completely, completely. The, wow. Us as a couple just came out yeah. completely, completely different um, both times. You inspire so. me to really take advantage <laughs> next time she comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think now she may only be working virtually. She's uh, not doing the same work. Okay. She's, she's a lot okay. older. But um, mm. kind of feels similar to what you're talking about, mm. that there's mm. the healing capacity belongs to, in right. that case, the couple, or in, what right. you're talking about, the individual. Right. And we're here to kind of facilitate right. Because, I mean, why keep it in the therapy room? I mean, if we can give people the skills to be able to be agents of their own healing and connection, I mean, surely that's just so much more valuable. Yeah, 100%. You know, last week we had, um, somewhere in the background there, we had um, Mayor K, Mayor Commonson, who recently became a breathwork instructor. Right. Had like 35 or 40 people here and it's just all you got to do is breathe right i mean and that is just I've, I've recently had a couple of breathwork sessions and absolutely blown away um by just the depth and and power of what one can achieve just through breathing it's it's the most one at the conference we had the legendary stan groff mm -hmm. one of the fathers of psychedelic medicine um, he he's done probably more psychedelic sessions in a way of psychotherapy therapy sessions than anyone on the planet. He did over four thousand LSD psychotherapy sessions. Wow. Wrote a textbook, one of his many books, LSD psychotherapy. Uh, he was at the work, at the conference and did a two day breath workshop. He's ninety two years old. Wow! And just yeah, just so amazing. Yeah, the, he made holotropic breath. He developed holotropic, right? Yeah. So when when LSD became illegal, he sought to 
discover a technique drawing on the yogis and their technologies of using breathing to shift consciousness that would be able to achieve something similar uh, to the psychedelic space with the advantage of course of it being non-artificial and being able to modulate and control that so much more powerfully you know once you ingest a a tab of acid uh, you've got a 12-hour train <laughs> that you're on and can't really get off unless you take tranquilizers which is not ideal because it also disrupts uh, the journey in fact one of the amazing contributions that stan groff many contributions but that he gave was the understanding of a flashback phenomenon so there used to be um you know uh, uh, people would say that lsd causes flashbacks because it's stored in the s spine and it kind of stays for many many years and there's been no proof of that and stan groff explained that what really is happening is that if a person is in a process and they're not prepared, they're not in the right environment and it's so overwhelming and they're not supported to go through that process, to have a breakthrough in healing, then what happens is that the psyche kind of you know, defends and, and the walls come up, the barriers, and it's interrupted. And the flashbacks is simply kind of a knocking on the door of the psyche saying, hey, we have unfinished work here. Um, versus you know it's actually kind of stored stored in the body but yeah it's such an incredible thing to all these different modalities you know breath work um, consciousness work where we are able to uh, even without any you know psychedelic uh, agent that is ingested really achieve quite uh, quite similar I mean I, I was absolutely amazed at, at, at um, how similar um, even though not the exact same intensity and, and kind of sort of phenomenology uh, as, a, as a full you know, immersive psychedelic, uh, say, psilocybin uh, journey or ayahuasca journey. But it was really, really very similar in the same kind of space. Definitely in the same vein. Yeah, yeah. same vein for sure. Yeah, as a, yeah. As a quality. And again, all of these things, it's you yeah. know going back to uh, ourself. Right. You know, when I was sitting with um, Gabor Mate, I asked him the question, um, and I'll ask the same one to you, is on the one hand, it seems like things are deteriorating. Right, globally. Right. And it's specifically with mental health. And on the other hand, things seem to be moving forward. Just in ways, evolving. And right, in ways they never have. So where are you on, um, are we falling apart? Or I love that question. I'll start, with the opposite. The, I'll start with a quote that resonated so powerfully for me. I believe it is a Canadian playwright named Buna Mohammed. He said, sometimes you find yourself in chaos. And sometimes in chaos, you find yourself. And for me, you know, that was really resonant during COVID. And I would give a lot of talks uh, in the work that I do sometimes in mindfulness and Jewish mindfulness. And there was something that I, I really shared a lot because I feel that that captures this paradox. You know, in, uh, in Jewish mysticism, there's this concept of shivirat hakelim, the breaking mm -hmm. and the shattering of the vessels in order to create this world that we are in now was created by a breakdown of the previous world. So when you think about breaking, um, that's a universal pattern. I mean, Carl Jung spoke of the, the um, death-rebirth archetype, and uh, it's a universal pattern. I mean, any true transformation, if you think about it, you have to have a dissolution and breakdown of the previous paradigm, whether it's a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. It doesn't just grow wings. It's a complete new transformation in creature in every respect. But before it transforms, it has to go into the cocoon, and the old dies and the new is born, a seed. Think of the level of transformation of a seed that you plant in the ground to the uh, potentially huge tree and fruit and ad infinitum other trees that can be created from mm -hmm. that. And that transformation happens by the seed first disintegrating. And so in the psyche level, as humans, um, on a, psyche means soul in Greek, actually, not mind. Oh. So we go through periods, and it's designed that way, of breaking down. And that's where Gabor Mate's work has been so incredibly powerful to help us understand. I mean, there's a documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, called The Wisdom of Trauma that mm -hmm. was done on his work. Yeah. And I mean, that captures and conveys so amazingly this concept that it's not that we grow despite trauma. We grow specifically because of trauma. The gift of the wisdom of trauma is that it forces us you know, whether it's a rock bottom in addiction, whether it's a traumatic thing that we go through, whether it's tremendous disconnection and midlife crisis, which Jung spoke about so extensively um, as the appointment with one's soul, the midlife crisis, the psyche engineers. If a person is not growing beyond, you know, they reach their midlife and they've done, they've ticked all the boxes of society, they've gotten married, they've got a job, they've had kids, and now what? And there's this gnawing emptiness and void inside. And it will get louder and louder if they don't address that calling of the soul to say, I'm not going to let you just live in this narrow bandwidth for the rest of your life. You need to grow and evolve. So if the person doesn't wake up 
naturally, then the psyche will engineer a breakdown to force that change, to have that shattering of the vessel. And that's what the psychedelic space is. The psychedelic space is a shattering of the vessel. You know, the, the classic psychedelics is, which is so hard um, and scary sometimes and terrifying, is because our normal frame and vessel just gets, you know, smashed apart for a couple of hours. In psychological terminology, we call that an ego dissolution. So I really believe that we're in an embryonic phase in the world where there's a new there's a birth of a new order the old structures are are coming tumbling down there's no doubt about it and we need to reimagine reinvent we need to be broken open we need to have our hearts broken open most most especially i think in order to be able to realize what possibilities and, and manifest new ways of being in the world so that we can avert this uh you know course of self-destruction that we've quite strongly planted ourselves on so it's so necessary it's so urgent you know it was so amazing to hear paul stamets a legendary world's leading mm -hmm. mycologist speak i bumped into him as well um at the conference and to hear him in his address it was just so moving he, he spoke about he's such an integrating being it's it's just amazing but he spoke about how we need to bring together the ancient wisdom and technology it's not one or the other there's a way to integrate the two and um yeah he kind of said like you know having one eye on the ancient wisdom and one eye on technology in the future and to find a new way of really having them coexist he spoke about in the political spectrum finding a way to bring the opposite sides and the fragmentation that we're seeing so much in the political uh, divide um how can that be healed? How can there be an integration? Um, so I think that this breaking uh, space that we are in is simultaneously actually spawning. Right, a the whole two new, fit quite well together uh, in your world. Yeah. I can see that. Let's shift to um, music a little bit. So as a musician and now psychologist, moving into the healing of it, um, I, I want to hear a little bit about it, but I also I want to kind of put it in the context maybe of um, Judaism a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. So when when we grew up, and I think you grew up Chabad as well, I grew up. There was this message always around music and how music is someone's a, a writing of their soul. Yeah, and pen of their soul. a pen, a pen of their soul, and and listening to that music, um, we connect to them in some way. And there was a sensitivity around different types of music that one um, that one listens to. Yeah. At the same point in time. Um, a lot of these medicines come with certain musics, music attached to it. And one of the most common, I guess, questions around the, the medicine yeah. has within Judaism has been the role of music uh, within it. And I, th I thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with you because, you know, as much as, as some of it is medicine, yeah. And it's medicine, but if it's... I believe the music is the real medicine. <laughs> the medicine just opens up the music. It's such a... Right, so what is that music then? And which yeah. music is the medicine? And are there music, is other music not the medicine? Yeah. I just see this conversation coming up yeah. um, so often. So yeah. music, medicine, the link, yeah. Judaism, yeah. all of that. Can you dive in? So another of uh, my heroes that I bumped into in the conference, uh, Dr. Robert Carr Harris, he's... Uh, heads up the Centre for Psychedelic Research in London Imperial uh, College of Medicine in the UK and um, had a beautiful, uh, I shared uh, some of my bowls and chants and <laughs> frequencies with him just for two minutes. He was very touched and moved. And um, he he has a whole division. That's uh, And there's a guy, Mendel Kalin, who's um, a psychiatrist and, and has dedicated his research work to studying the music that's involved in these spaces and how to optimize that. He's even come up with a, a platform, an AI-based kind of, uh, where it really has this ability when you're working as a therapist in these spaces to have music that can naturally adapt to what the person is needing in terms of where they're going and the contours of their journey and emotionally. How does so, it know where they're going? So it's based on, you know, algorithms and AI and it's, 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 it's this ability to be able to seamlessly... But what are the inputs? So it's a good question. I don't know enough of the technology, but I, if you want to look it up, it's called wave paths, beta wave paths, one word wave paths. And um, yeah, I, I haven't had time to really kind of get into the, the nuts Understood. and bolts of how it works and how it's been developed, but it's really an astounding technology that is so useful in that space. But on a more broader you know, level, you know, I think that um, typically uh, you've got you know, music 
traditionally music has always been used in healing and in shamanic healing certainly in the mm-hmm. tribal context and psychedelic spaces whether it's whether consciousness is induced and connection is achieved through ingesting a medicine or tr- you know trance dancing for a couple of hours around a fire there's so many ways but uh, music has always played a, a vital core role in that space and in the psychedelic healing space the music is really a key anchor it's a modulator it's really what holds a person um, and takes them along different uh, spaces within themselves by virtue of the different type of music. So, I mean, you know, traditional music in the tribal context can involve shakers and just singing tunes and, and chants and uh, drums of different sorts. And, you know, you have hybrid models today where you have, uh, you know, some of the instruments that I have here, like the singing bowls, which I was introduced to in the ayahuasca space, actually. Um, and hang drum, you know, hang pan drum kinds of things, all kind of vibrational instruments. But then you have, you know, the possibility, there's really no right or wrong music. The music is there really just to help people connect. One of the things, one of the main things that they have found in, uh, in this research work in the psychedelic space, certainly, is that what's important when people are in a deep journey is to try and avoid music with lyrics that will engage the rational mind Mm. so it could be languages that people don't understand you know mantras often in the western context which is kind of there's some lyrics but it's it's sort of it's not uh words that is going to entangle the mind because you want to get out of the mind and the rational the whole point of this work and healing is getting into the heart the emotional space the body um so that's one aspect in terms of kind of being just mindful of music that has lyrics that people might know because that may take them into their head uh, rather than the body and heart where they where you where they want to be um but really i mean the the, the, the music is there, there's a lot of you know there's a whole genre of medicine music that's that's developed now even in the jewish uh music world you know you have um some artists amazing gifted artists like eviatar banai an incredible uh musician and and, and artist from israel who has a version of the shalosh tenuas nigan of the baal shem Tov and the altar yeah, shared, uh, shared with you yeah which is just i mean it, it's it's a medicine piece in, in the sense of the way and the style and the textures and the richness how it evokes such deep, you know, I've had many non-Jewish people uh, hear that and experience that and just be so moved and so touched. So there's a certain quality. So can you explain what you mean by that term medicine music? Yeah, so, I mean, medicine music is really a kind of genre that's 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 ev- developed, which which is uh, connotes music that is used in deep journeys, whether medicine or, or breath work or, mm-hmm. you know, and typically it's a kind of um, very rich, uh, tapestry and layers of different sound textures. So it will be ambient, sometimes electronic. It might be soft beats. Or, uh, at, at times it might be more lively and, and, and rhythmic. But it's really a whole lot of different musical textures and frequencies. There may be bells and maybe chimes. There may be, you know, it, it, it's, it's a music that when one listens to it, you kind of feel a natural dropping into a connection. You feel the music and the vibrational quality of that type of music naturally and just more powerfully and effectively so that's sort of and it's a very broad you know there's so much variety within that right but um it's yeah it's, i meant from a musical perspective what the um what medicine music is and you're saying it's yeah. layered it's textured. It's layered it's textured it's got different kinds of soundscapes and, and frequencies and it's um yeah it's, it's really you know it's got a chanting it's got some repetitive elements it's also got some sort of diverse and and changes um and it really it takes one on the jersey it's the kind of mu- music that takes you on a journey when you listen to it and you feel it that you if, if you really close your eyes and, and and drop in yeah i mean i'm very connected to to medicine music and mm. certain songs especially that i've heard on different mm. journeys and its ability to bring me back right, right. To, so that's the other thing from an integration perspective is you know what, what i often recommend for people uh, if they consult me in terms of input in terms of uh, psychedelic supports and preparation and integration which i do quite a lot of is um to be able to get the music that was played during the processes and listen <laughs> to it afterwards because there's really um you know, neural wiring that gets uh, so opened up with that music. And by just listening to those frequencies afterwards, you're supporting the laying down of those new pathways. So it's so helpful to be able to, while you're journaling, while you're meditating, while you're, you know, <laughs> reflecting and processing what you've been through. There's so much that comes through in that 
fundamental opening uh, to be able to use the music to support that. And the integration is absolutely crucial because any uh, psychedelic or other consciousness inducing uh, shifting uh, process like breathwork will, will create a powerful window of an opening on a very powerful way that will last in an afterglow for a while, mm -hmm. days, weeks, months. But if there isn't real work to integrate that and, and embed that, uh, in a day-to-day, -day, more regular practice, that at some point th that will just close that aperture, and um, so music can be such a powerful way to to keep that growing, to allow those seeds to take root and to unfold more in your life. So, so would you say that you know medicine music, although that can span many different um, types of music and singers and right. languages and everything right. else, but that genre is important for medicine work and putting on. I don't know, let's say Chabad Nagunim or something like that would maybe would would have a lesser medicinal effect, possibly? Quite likely, you know, depending on what kind of style the Nagunim are done. You know, look, Correct. any music, I mean, music is music and music is so powerful and it takes us, you know, um, it's like this universal language, it's infinite. Uh, it's such a powerful force, full stop. Um, but uh, I always think of a teaching by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, the, the classic uh, first generation Hasidic master, who said a beautiful thing. He said, why is it that when someone is speaking, when you look at them, you can process and follow more what they're saying. But when there's music playing, when you close your eyes, you can tune into it so much more deeply and effectively. And he says, why is it also that when someone is speaking, you can only hear one person talking at a time, two, three, certainly more is discombobulating, <laughs> whatever that means. It's overwhelming. You can't process it. But music, you could potentially have hundreds, thousands of musicians and singers if they can sing. And not only is it possible, but it can enhance. Right. Um, why is that so? So he says a beautiful teaching. He says that the world was created with words, the 10 utterances. God used words to create the world. So when someone is speaking, they are using a world frequency. And so the world is limited, time and space. And, and so when they speak, and the more you see their worldly existence, the physical, you know, you, you tap into that more, and it's limited one at a time. But music is beyond the world. Music is God's divine language, infinite. And the less you have your eyes open, seeing the physical material reality, the more you can tune into that. And it's unlimited because it's infinite. So uh, music has a power full stop. But certainly I think that... Um, there's a certain genre, in this case, this kind of medicine music style that is just so much more conducive to really helping people drop uh, into these deeper spaces within themselves. And the um, hero's journey, what is it, not hero's journey, the hero's dose, which has become a heroic dose, right, five has become so popular, sort of, five grands, yeah. blindfolded, no yeah. music, no sound. Uh, I don't know about no, I suppose uh, there, there's, some, there's some models that say no right. sound. There's even some shamanic uh, models that you know, complete <coughs> Darkness and with ayahuasca and some of the, I think Shapibo tradition, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, that that uh, that advocate that. But you know, look, si silence and the interplay between sound and silence is another incredible topic. It's a, another rabbit hole we can go down, maybe, but a little bit. But uh, you know, there's a beautiful mystical teaching that um, the Sinai revelation. It's actually by the Rimanova River, Mendel Rimanova, I believe, who said that not only can the whole Torah be condensed into the Ten Commandments and further condensed into the first word of the Ten Commandments, that the whole Torah can be seen as encapsulated in the first letter of the first word of the Ten Commandments, the Aleph. And what's so unique about Aleph is Aleph is a silent letter. It has no sound. The only sound that Aleph has is the vowel that you place underneath. You might think an iron is silent, but it's not. The iron has a guttural, the, the actual um, technically halachic sound of an iron, the way the um, mm -hmm. you know, Moroccan and Yemenites uh, People uh, vocalize it. It actually has a sound. Aleph is, si is silence. So the revelation at Sinai was actually silence. And out of the, the source, this infinite silence, um, comes the revelation, comes the sound, comes the vibration. Um, and I just think it's a beautiful, I mean, even the, the beautiful teaching in the Midrash that the Torah is black fire on white fire. And the letters, the white is also like a silence. It's like an all-inclusive white and encompasses all colors. And the black is sort of, you know, the letters are, are, are emerging and condensing out of that infinite space of silence of white. Um, if you think of condensation of water from steam to water to ice, it's all the same molecule. Um, but it's just different levels are from a much more refined coming into a more solid and into the most solid form. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of value. I think it's important as well to mention silence in, in these spaces to give space for silence. 
because that allows the processing of what the music is bringing up and it allows um, us to connect to the silence within ourselves and the mystery and that ability to pull new notes, to create a new chapter and story in our life, to sing a new song. So I think the silence is important, but I think that music as well, balanced well with the silence, has the most incredible um, just quality to help support this kind of uh, connecting and healing and shifts. Yeah. And one of the things in maps as well that is so important is the balance between periods of a person going inside with the headphones if they choose to and, and wish to um, and coming outside and, and talking about some of the experience and then being invited to go back in. And there's very much a strong focus on uh, trying to have a balance between allowing and inviting internal time, uh, connecting with music and or silence. Sometimes people want to go inside without any of the music and the headphones um, and balancing that with kind of, you know, coming out and... and Is there specific music that they recommend or have developed? So they, they, they do that. They have certain playlists that have been recommended and curated and, uh, and there's a wide, you know, range of that. And there's choice within that as well. And um, in the preparation uh, sessions, what's discussed is what the sessions will be like, what will happen, what will the form and kind of... And one of the aspects that's spoken about is the head shades that's provided their music um, if the person chooses. And there's a discussion, you know, that can be had in terms of what music would resonate for you more and so that's that's paid a lot of attention to as well and how yeah. that can best be optimized for the person yeah yeah very neat very neat it's fascinating that the conversation is coming up as much as it is at least in my world mm. around um music and the place for it and the role of it right and uh right you know the discomfort it creates right for uh right for some people right you know with um uh, dr matthew johnson from john hopkins who i interviewed a short time ago you know, also shared different uh, vein, but it feels somewhat similar around just the mystical quality of the experiences and how that is tied to um, the the long term results right. and positive right. impact. Right, that the most someone has astounding thing. I mean, they've discovered, and science cannot explain why this is, but all that science <clears throat> can say and has to admit is that mystical experience is essential for our well-being <laughs> and health. Because when you have you know, these studies that have given people high-dose, hero-dose psilocybin, for whatever reason, which I don't even know if they've even researched, there's a small percentage of people that with a high-dose hero um, you know, uh, dosage do not have the mystical experience. Maybe they're defending against it, maybe they other factors, but that uh, small percentage of people that doesn't have the mystical element do not have the same dramatic therapeutic uh, effects. So it's not just, you know, the medicine um, uh, that leads to, uh, it's the experience uh, and the nature of that mystical kind of uh, the ego dissolving. And when the ego dissolves and the mind uh, dissolves, it allows a person to contact the totality of their whole being. We live in the attic of our being. We just live in our head. And we're so stuck in our, our mind talk and narratives and judgments. Um, it's such a gift to be able to be, launched out of our heads which can be hard and challenging and vulnerable and uncomfortable but to then be able to have the gift of accessing the totality of our being and these other realms that are so more important that the research is, is showing now and uh, yeah that, that that mystical aspect is really just uh, you know one of the most powerful uh, articulations of Judaism for me has been by the later of Dovid Zeller who's a very big mentor for me a spiritual mentor he, he was a uh, transpersonal psychologist actually one of the founding transpersonal psychologists in the States and the Institute of, Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, the ITP. And transpersonal psychology is a space in psychology that um, studies consciousness and where we transcend our personal ego realm. Jung is seen as one of the fathers. Stan Groff is uh, another one that's seen. Uh, Ken Wilber is seen as one of them, uh, a contemporary philosopher and psychologist. And um, David Zeller was very involved in that space. And he said the most beautiful statements about living Judaism, living authentic Judaism. He said, living Judaism is not meant to cut you off from the world around you. It is meant to prevent you from being cut off from the world within you. And it's just such a profound, I'll say it again because it's just so deep. Yeah. Living Judaism is not meant to cut you off from the world around you. It is meant to prevent you from becoming cut off from the world within you. And that concept of we have an internal universe, that mm -hmm. mystical space, we don't contact <laughs> that much. We live so much in the outside, you know, social media and devices. We're so enmeshed in this kind of um, noisy, distracted uh, reality or virtual, not even reality, that we're just not even in contact with our own internal universe and the magic and the mystery that we have inside. 
and that's a fundamental principle in any mystical tradition, and certainly in Kabbalah and Judaism, that a human being is called an olam katan, a miniature microcosmic world. And all of Judaism is really there as a, a vehicle to help us connect with that internal world. The very first commandment to the first Jew, Jews, Sarah, Abraham, and Sarah, is lech lecha, which literally means go to yourself. Right. Go, the first go imperative in. in Judaism is go, lech, go, go on a journey, be, be, be evolving, grow, don't stay stagnant. And where's that journey to? It's to yourself, inside. Right. And the rest of the verses leave your birthplace, your father's place, all the conditioning and narratives who you've thought you are and become. Um, and smash those idols. If you think of Abraham as the idol smasher archetype. Judaism is about refuse to let your infinite soul, you know, Rabbi Wawa Jacobson always says we are ambassadors of infinity, <laughs> refuse to allow the infinity that lives inside you to be limited by what society says or by your family you know, narratives or whatever it is. Discover the land which I will show you, the mystery. God does not say what that territory is because we need to, he's empowered us to find that for ourselves. And it's such a beautiful thing to, to think of, you know, all of Judaism is really, mitzvah means connection. Every mitzvah and ritual act with intention is an opportunity, a doorway into that spiritual reality that really lives inside each one of us. And halacha, which is the term for the body of, of, of legal you know, practice and what you should and what you shouldn't do, means journey, halach, holech is to go. Right. And this is just... So your understanding of that, halacha, as it connects to this? Because often it can feel so disconnected. So disconnecting, and yeah. I mean, it's like a great example and case in point is Shabbos. So many Jews struggle with Shabbos as being restrictive. I can't do this. I can't operate this device. I can't. But when you understand that the ritual of separating from the outside worlds and world and noise for one 24-hour period is just never been more relevant and precious in our world today than it is. Because it's precisely when you cut out and restrict in that ritual practice, all the noise and distractions, that you can have this beautiful space and opportunity to connect with yourself, to connect with your loved ones, your family, to walk in nature and see and experience immersively nature instead of just driving in your car and sheltered the whole time. So it's the paradox in Kabbalah, that Kabbalah is filled with paradox, but that the, there's a potency in the ritual practice. Any mysticism and, 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 and um, idea or, or, or concept of revelation without a practical component and a practice and a way of life is just an idea. It's not, it's not transformative. The transformation comes in the practice of it. And that's this paradox that, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe spoke of the beautiful metaphor of a laser beam. A laser beam is just light rays, but so condensed and contained with such focus that it can cut diamonds. And so... The, the ritual sort of practices and, and the parameters of the ritual practice is not meant to box us in. It's meant to actually keep us connected to the infinity and the wonder and the mystery so that we can live as more infinite beings and ambassadors of infinity. That's really the whole pathway of Judaism and halacha. It's just so misunderstood and it's tragic that it isn't taught in that way, um, you know, in schools more and, and, and really given that true essence of what it's really all about. Right, it's felt often like it's just about yeah the yeah the practice yeah. But you're saying it's the practice for the purpose of connecting with our inner world. <clears throat> it's like um, talking of the inner world. Uh, Rumi said it best. He said, "I love this this line." He said, "You're not a drop in the ocean. You're the ocean in a drop." Mm -hmm. And Judaism is really to help us break out of our Mitzrayim, our Egypt, our personal e Mitzrayim. In Hebrew, means narrow. It's stuck. And uh, it's all about connecting with an openness and, and living from a place of mystery and wonder. It's this ayin in, in Hebrew, nothingness. Um, the famous psalm, Psalm 121, that says, uh, I lift my eyes up to the mountains from where will my help come? Normally that's, that's understood as a question, but it can also be seen as a statement. May ayin, from the level of nothingness, of mystery, of wonder, of curiosity, that's where my help will come. It's that holy curiosity of a child that uh, we call B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, for a reason. You know, we should be like children. We should be open. We should be curious. And that's our freedom. That's why the festival of Pesach and Passover is all oriented around the questions of a child. Because we need to get in touch with our own inner child to stay free. To have, you, have you found in your personal journey that... Um, this traveling 
Yeah. This the inner traveling. Yes. Has um, bolstered, supported your Judaism. Absolutely. In a way that is humbling and precious. I I I, I am so. Where were you at before? So I've been learning and teaching Kabbalah and Hasidic teachings for two decades now. I'm 45. I've been very blessed to have amazing teachers and uh, my Hebrew grasp uh, is very good. I'm able to learn in the original texts. And, uh, and I, you know, I often say that my initiation into the ayahuasca space, uh, well, the, the, the sort of psychedelic healing space, which happened to start with ayahuasca in the serious focused way, yeah. uh, it was so formative in my life that I see my life as up till that point and since that point. Because ironically, um, the, the experience of that journey was so hard, but it was so grounding. It, it dropped me into, it's like all the Kabbalistic and Hasidic and mystical teachings that I'd been learning about, speaking about, but it was up till that point more conceptual, not something that I lived and was embodied. That just dropped it into a reality. It was like, you know, when, you, when you're in those kinds of spaces, you, you, you see the the hidden worlds and universes inside yourself as well it's not like you you experience it it's not mm. like you're watching it you're in it it's it's you 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 contact the the power that we have to to change our narratives how we have the power to shift the way we see things and look at things you have this incredible higher perspective and and uh, it's really you can't come out of that in a way almost not changed you know it's very rare to not be fundamentally, it's, a, it's an ontological encounter with the deeper realm of reality and spirituality that is fundamentally right. transformative. It certainly was for me, and especially- in I've seen many people not changed. Yeah. They, they'll see it, yeah. and they'll wrestle with it for a few weeks, yeah. and there's some that doesn't jive with their life about that experience, yeah. but then it'll very quickly recede. recede. Yeah, so that, a lot depends on the in intention and where the person's right. at, how ready they are, what they're wanting out of it, um, what they're involved in, you know, uh, but I think for me, being a, a psychologist and, and involved uh, in Jewish mysticism as well, which is really the study of, of our human psyche in so many ways, you know, all the sefirot of the different parts of our being and, and the makeup of our soul, uh, entering that and having that kind of experience was just such a gift because it really, um, it took things from just an academic level study relatively to a whole different level of... So, so what do you make of that? What do you make of needing ayahuasca in order to understand Kabbalah? I, would, I definitely wouldn't stretch it to... I, I wouldn't I'm saying say for you, you, I'm not saying for me. everyone. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, what yeah. I would say is that I understand by that that part of the what's so painful for me is the, the tragedy that there is a more experiential um, spaces for experiencing Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism rather than just studying it. You know, um, I've had this conversation with one of my great rabbis who's uh, you know, a really leading um, expert in uh, the Chabad Hasidic world. And I've said, you know, how is this possible that, that we don't have access to the techniques of, of inducing you know, states of meditation and his bonanut and his... Bon uh, like, like Chabad is famous for, for you know you, you hear in the Alter Rebbe would, would give his Hasidic teachings in ecstasy he was rolling around on the ground <laughs> there was a Hasid who would roll with him to catch fragments of what he was saying mm -hmm. the Rebbe in our generation the Lubavitcher Rebbe in seventh generation which is a staggering thing because he was so pro-action but he s related the story in a, in a Fabringen that uh, in the days of the Alter Rebbe uh, they had to put padding and cushioning on the walls because the Hasidim were in such states of ecstasy that they were flinging themselves against the walls and they were in danger of hurting themselves. And the Rebbe, <laughs> and the Rebbe said on that, as he often would say, almost always would say, the fact that that story reached our ears is by divine providence, Hashgacha practice, a, 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 a lesson indication and yeah. lesson that we should strive to at least something of those levels. Mm -hmm. And when I asked my rabbi this, uh, you know, he kind of said, well, I can't really tell you where to go for because it was lost. Um, the people who are living in these states uh, only 250 years ago, I mean, it's just staggering to think about, um, didn't, no one took it on themselves to charter the territory, to you know, systematize ways of how to, uh, and it wasn't preserved and it was, it was lost. And that's one aspect. And I think another aspect that's so pertinent and relevant to why these tools can be so, because there's a big debate in the Jewish world 
today in the observant and Hasidic Jewish world in terms of whether there's almost no question anymore in terms of the research and for healing. I mean, saving Jewish life uh, is the greatest imperative of the Torah above all mm-hmm. else. Um, and uh, the real pandemic today is the mental health crisis. So there, there sh- there's no question and shouldn't be a question as to whether these are halakhically um, allowed to be explored for healing, you know. But the real question is can Well, it seems to be that anyone who understands the healing properties of these things yeah is is on board with it yeah yeah I and mean, yeah. the research is is unequivocal right. but 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 the the real <coughs> question and debate is can these things be should they be even looked at or considered as tools for spiritual connection and experience because we have our own Hasidic tradition and you know so this is another whole perspective that i think is really important and relevant and i um i think that it's it's something to do with the fact that the jewish nation has had such centuries of millennia of persecution, death, uh, hatred, insecurity, abject poverty, um, alienation, trauma. It's our collective psyche is full of it. And the transgenerational trauma that exists in the Jewish um, people is 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 huge. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the reasons Rabbi Zach Kamenitz, who founded the Jewish Entheogenic Society, entheogen is another term for mm-hmm. psychedelic. It, it means manifesting the divine within. It's sometimes a preferred term to psychedelic that has associations with the hippie movement and, and mm-hmm. that time. Um, but he, he was one of the few uh, rabbis and clergy to actually uh, be part of a trial where they were studying how these things can be helpful for spiritual leaders. And he had such profound experiences and he really... I think believes that um, I don't want to speak for him, but but that these can be very powerful tools to help the healing of the intergenerational trauma that exists in the Jewish nation, and um, potentially tools to help us reconnect with our essence of our teaching and tradition. Because when you have centuries of trauma, trauma is disconnection. Trauma is numb. So we've 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 got the teachings and we've got the practices, but we're left with kind of the shell versus the heart and soul of the experience of what those actions and rituals are meant that's to That's what bring. it often feels like. And yeah. I think that that's an important historical context to keep in mind in terms of why it's so hard to find naturally without the help of tools like this, um, teachers and, and, you know, there's very few people around who, like Daniel Katz from Australia mm-hmm. is one of them who's really working amazingly in experiential ways and retreats. and but he's, he's made somewhat of an about face on, on psychedelics because several has, years ago, Several years ago, he was very opposed to it. Yeah, yeah. But in the past couple of years, he's kind of been a lot. Yeah. yeah. Several years ago, his approach seemed to be that um, it's not the Jewish way, and these can be accessed, mm. um, you know, through other means. Let me take you through a meditation. Yeah. And I've done some of his meditations, and they're powerful and yeah. they're nice. Yeah. Uh, it's on ayahuasca. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I. So, so that's I'm not f- sure what led to that for him, but there was an about right. face right. for him where now he definitely is much more supportive of uh, of these tools. Right. So that's the, the you know that's the thing. Yes, you can access these states in other ways uh, and non artificial ways. Um, uh, although it's so interesting because you can call them artificial agents, but really they're just connecting us to our own authenticity. The stuff that comes out in the visuals and the whatever channels is really just our own, know, our own stuff. So is it artificial? Okay, it's artificially induced, but but um, you know you can achieve that without yeah. without these these tools potentially theoretically, but practically they don't happen. Who, who's got the time to meditate for two hours a day? You know, for years, you know, even a half an hour a day to kind. I'm saying, yes, you need to, to achieve that. You, you've got to almost have a sort of monastic, you have to have tremendous space, tremendous discipline, tremendous um, teaching and input, and, and, and we don't have the, that system kind of available and teachers and space and time in our world. So I really feel that there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a room for looking at the need for how these tools can be helpful to help us just connect, not that the, the tool is the, 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 the focus, but that the tools to help invigorate and, and connect us to those deeper aspects of, of our practice and can really be helpful. Uh, I know I might be very controversial for saying that, but I, I do believe that they can and maybe it needs to be explored in some ways. How, and it's a very tricky you know, question in terms of just 
what is the way to do that? Well, you know, these are complex uh, substances and, and medicines and, and, you know, to start to look at it on a sort of bigger scale is an important question. It's one of the things that was addressed in this amazing one day uh, Jewish Psychedelic Summit workshop that I was privileged to attend on the uh, Tuesday before the main workshop from Wednesday to Friday last week. Um, Rabbi Zach Kamenitz and um, uh, Madison Margolin mm -hmm. together um, founded, I believe, uh, this uh, Jewish Psychedelic Summit event, which was online a couple of months ago. And at the conference they had on the Tuesday, a full day workshop where um, it was really getting together, bringing our minds and hearts together to discuss what is psychedelic Judaism? What can it look like? What, you know, what are the questions we need to ask? Why is it so important? What's the relevance? Um, and it was a very beautiful uh yeah, session to to be part of and, and to really they used what's called an open um, open uh, space technology uh, format to facilitate that and to bring everyone's voices in and they had a beautiful what they called marketplace where everyone was given a slot to be able to share what ju psychedelic Judaism means for them. It could be a discussion, it could be a breathing workshop, a movement based kind of session. I shared my my balls and, and <laughs> chanting and nigunim, you know, uh, which is very dear to me and connected to that space. So it was just such a wonderful uh, experience experience to uh, in our tribe get together and uh, explore that whole question right it's a fascinating conversation because i've i've never gone there for um the spiritual experience yeah. you know but um it's it's added so much richness yeah to my judaism right. and to, as a natural yeah yeah natural byproduct of it yeah. and you know it was all <laughs> Like, can you be sick enough that you can get the benefit of this, right? That almost seems to be the way right, it's right. it's viewed now. Right, right. And then, you know, going back to what we said earlier, is that the healing really comes about through the the mystical experience. But there, there's been a level of appreciation, um, you know, for prayer that I, I could have never had reading all the books in the world. Right, right. And e even breath work, you know, where today I can access... Like one way I described the breathwork experience from last week was that it was an ayahuasca experience. Mm. Like I was mm. full on and yeah, immersed. <laughs> yeah, just a completely different, um, different reality. And, but I had a breathwork coach that I worked closely with, uh, the years 2016, 2017, approximately. And my first psychedelic experience was 2019. And while I had a lot of nice experiences on breathwork, it wasn't until I had breakthrough experiences on psychedelics that I was able to experience something similar, similar on the breathwork on side. Breathwork. Wow, that and, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and you see, that's the beautiful um, frame of or, or lens to look at this as opening the doors of perception, like the famous book right. by Aldous Huxley, taken from a William Blake uh, poem, uh, Doors of Perception from the Band, it also kind of took from the name from the book. Uh, it's a Penguin classic, amazing book to read. It, it, it's, it's so genius how Aldous Huxley was able to be in the experience and be beyond it and observe it and write about it um, at the same time and um, you know it, it, it correlates he, he, he uses the term mind at large which is just such a great translation of the term in Kabbalah and Hasidus moichin de gadlus expanded consciousness versus moichin de katnus mm -hmm. and you know he really explains how uh, his understanding of how things like psychedelics and breath uh, of the yogis techniques um, is just really uh, switches off the reducing valve of the brain filtering out because if we could take in all that's po <coughs> possible to take in in the visual and oh, auditory, way too much it's way too much our brains are you know a computer in many ways and so uh, for survival purposes the bandwidth is just so much more narrow what happens when you have one of these uh, induced ex experiences of expanding consciousness he really um, uh, explains that it's because somehow there's a uh, the effect that these things have is switching off that reducing valve so it allows a flooding in of, of awareness and this door is open Opened of perception and things appear as they always do infinite or as they always have been as William uh, Blake says in his poem and but the point is you know that don't keep just opening the door <laughs> the doors are opened in such an unusual way to help you learn how to open them in more natural ways yourself through meditation, through breath, through um, music. And, I use music all the yeah, time. Yeah, music, absolutely. And when you combine music and movement and breath, mm -hmm. you know, you've got incredible combinations of technologies that we just, you know, the, 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 there's so much... Um, there's so much uh, research now about movement and, and, and dance and how just getting into the body and that somatic level of, of work and, and unfolding is, is, is absolutely invaluable. 
it's such an underutilized and breath as well and using breath and sound and you know um, intonation and uh, there's ways of working with so many of these different modalities which when as you say the doors are open so powerfully with something as profound and in a way unparalleled in the level of how powerful and profound it is with a psychedelic medicine it's so much more it translates into so much more powerful openings using the other more natural technologies there's a great statement from the the legendary terence mckenna who is a fascinating uh, wizard conceptually with his his ideas and words is quite um uh, way out guy but but an incredible mind and, and and really mesmerizing to listen to but he had a great line he said when you get the message hang up the phone <laughs> you know and i think that that is just so salient to keep in mind when it comes to the integration and working with these things as tools not expecting it to do the work for you but when you work with it and you open to using it as a tool um the results can be just so transformative they, right. they will be so transformative let's talk about that because i'm I'm kind of early in my own, you know, maybe four years in to um, mm. the psychedelic um, living, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, like being on this planet with those <laughs> those experiences. I think that there's um, a, a shaman that I know well. He says, listen, I have a lot of experiences. He said, I do. He said, but it's not comparable to someone who has a lot of years mm. <laughs> living right. and experiences. So he right. said, I may have thousands of experiences because right. I did a lot in a short time. Right. But... This gentleman I'm going to tell you about and refer to the wisdom that has 40 years of living on this planet right. while <laughs> right. while doing those experiences. Right. So it's just a different um, yeah, a different perspective. A different perspective. Yeah. I, I do want to talk. Uh, so in terms of I mean, what I found for myself now is that you know getting the same message on medicine is a very very uncomfortable yeah. experience. Very uncomfortable. So you missed it the first time, and it's like yeah. here we are again. And even yeah. as I'm saying it, I'm. Yeah. Thinking like, okay, there's something that I'm ignoring right. now. That it's like next Hazara, time, right? coming no, back. No, that I'm going to come back in and say, oh, you already know it. Then you've said it. Then you've said it on a podcast. And, you know, like this will be part of the, <laughs> this will be part of the beating up that I'll get over it. And now it's kind of like, I don't want to do it. I, I don't, unless, like, let me try to do whatever I could. Right. To, to work things out right. before I go back there. Right. The last thing I want to do is have to come to a realization or a transformation or any real work in a psychedelic experience, it's so much more mm. graceful mm. <laughs> in real life. But if right. necessary, if we're stuck, right. then... Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is such a great approach. You know, I think that uh, um, there can certainly be a, a culture of just going back in, you know, and thinking that their work is just happening there mm -hmm. and going to the ceremonies and repeating the ceremonies and kind of not really doing the real, uh, there's a great, I think it's a Zen kind of cone, which says, um, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> you know, it's like we go into in Kabbalah, it's called Pardes in the Gomorrah even, it's referred to as these orchards of higher states. And But uh, in order to, the only one of the four sages who came out unscathed, the one died, the one threw off mm. the, their Judaism, and the one was a misfit that came back down and they were still holding up there while they were down, couldn't integrate. Uh, it was Rabbi Akiva, which the Gomorrah says, Nichnas b'shalem v'yatsa b'shalem. He went in with harmony, Shalom is, is completion, wholesomeness, and therefore he came out with wholesomeness, meaning that his intention was not just to separate and disconnect and go into this kind of like, but, but it was to go deeper, higher. Higher means deeper. I mean, we think of higher right. as like somewhere up there. The worlds are higher, worlds That's are in the sky. That's the spatial dimension in all. Higher is, you know, the four main worlds of Kabbalah, there are many more. The world of emanation, the world of creation, formation, and manifestation are all right here, right now. They're just deeper states of consciousness that I can tap into. But if I'm going into those deeper states um, for the purpose of bringing back and working on enriching my life in my relationships, in my practice in, in how I'm affecting the world and, and, and creating healing and tikkun olam and perfecting the world, then that, that is really uh, a wholesome, healthy way and approach. And so I think that in many ways, a question that's helpful to ask is before I go jumping back into any of these spaces, what is what is my calling? What is what is the question? That's you know what is my intention? Why am I am I consulting? You know, what are, so 
yeah, um, in general, intention is so important in focusing because you really open up to the whole inner and outer universe sort of simultaneously sometimes. And you can run around and, and have fun and play and explore and check out things. But how much you'll take out of that is helped by the focus that you come in with an intention. Um, but at the same time, you should also not be locked into an expectation. Be open mm -hmm. to whatever it is you need to see or re-see and re-contact with because maybe uh, there isn't uh, enough work that has been done on that. But even when you're going in just really check in with yourself what is my intention you know why now what am i trying to answer and 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 explore and um achieve um and is it warranted and is it the right time right your caution is for someone who's been there and is continuously yeah. going back yeah right yeah. My, my concern is that someone hearing that who's never done it yeah say oh you see like those are reasons not, those are reasons not to well yeah i mean i think that look, look it's a leap of faith i mean you know to do these these kinds of it, it's a for example, it's a complete different ball game um, to taking a, a, a threshold high dose psychedelic, certainly um, in a recreational context, uh, whereas it's structured as going inside yourself. When it's outside with people, music, social, even in nature, there can still be value and on the brain level and things like that, but it's like all of that potency has been diluted and spread by distracting aspects mm -hmm. in some way. Once it's structured as a journey into yourself, um, there's actually research that's come out from Andrew Huberman, who speaks about, he's a professor of ophthalmology mm -hmm. as well as the neuroscience, who says that there's, uh, the more that one can stay with eye shades and internally um, uh, in the space, the much more powerful and, and, and effective the results can be. Right. Um, so, you know, being able to, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it's scary to, we, we don't spend time with ourselves and in, in, in that <laughs> internal space. And so it can be, and it takes courage. It's a leap of faith to trust that, you know, the first time I heard about ayahuasca, I heard in the research and I was fascinated by it, but it was something that I was like, whoa, that's just sounds too intense. Maybe when I'm 70, <laughs> I'll check that out. You know, there's no, and then the divine providence brought me uh, to, to a, a friend and colleague, well, he's a mentor, he's quite a few years older than me, about a decade, a decade or so older than me. And um, a non-Jewish guy, actually, we were, connected from the Jungian side he's very into Jungian psychology and uh, he shared with me that he was working with ayahuasca it was the first time I met someone who I knew who I trusted who I looked up to and a very grounded guy and I was like wow you know tell me about this um, is it safe what's it like and, and ayahuasca is quite, quite grounding I think yeah compared to some of the other uh, right things, right at least <laughs> Uh, that was that was so striking for me. Yeah, like, it really. <laughs> I mean, I'm a musician, creative, ADD type kind of, you know, very much so. And it was probably one of the most grounding experiences I've ever had in my life. Yeah, I feel like it's right here, right yeah. now. You know, yeah, unlike psilocybin, in. which can right, right, right. It's interesting because it's this jungle <clears throat> plant from Mother Earth, and you know, it's got a sort of earthy. Uh, I mean, mushrooms also, but but uh, it it does have a very correct. And basically, his words to me were, "This is the most powerful technology and tool of human transformation, uh, and and and." you know, healing and growth that I've come across in my 30 years of work. And he said, if you do it in the right way with someone who's experienced, you know, it's, it's totally safe. And then I was just like, wow, okay. I, you okay. Know, I really want to kind of experience this. But, um, so I, and I was still very nervous. I was still really, you know, I'm sure you're still nervous. If you, every time, yeah, I mean, every time. you know, Terrence McKenna was, 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 who I mentioned earlier on was a spokesperson for the, the short DMT. So there's a smokable form of DMT, mm -hmm. um, sometimes called Changa in a different form. Uh, it's a five, minutes seven minutes you know but it's 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 like a slice of the 10 most intense minutes of an ayahuasca you know height of uh, mm -hmm. intensity um with a sort of slightly different feel and personality as well um but very similar and um he was a very big proponent he would speak at university he's a very smart man and tremendously versed in Jungian psychology and philosophy and so many disciplines transdisciplinarian kind of guy and um he would challenge people and say, you know, whatever judgments you have, just experience it. It's five, seven minutes. Nothing can happen to you. You know, you're not going to, uh, the worst, the, the, the worst dangers, mm -hmm. you might die from astonishment. He would say, <laughs> <laughs> if you're afraid of that, but you know, he would kind of say, um, yeah, just, uh, just, just give it a try. But, but it really, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's something which, I think, oh, so he, why I brought, yeah, I was trying to think, what was I going with Terrence McKenna? I now remember, he would say that every time he holds the pipe, his hands are shaking. <laughs> right, I've heard him say that. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, so so th th this is, you know, when you're doing it, it and doing it in a proper and respectful, sacred way, it's it's, it's challenging. It's, it takes yeah, courage. Yeah, it's very intense. But um, I think that once it becomes, uh, you know, a more path and way of life and a tool that one uses 
uh, in one's own journey, it's it's really important to ask that question of you know what is calling me this time, what question am I seeking to answer, what what is the purpose of of, of re um, engaging. You mentioned something earlier. Um, I'll kind of scroll up in the conversation. Someone, uh, a guest I had here a little while ago said, uh, "I like uh, scrolling up is a, a love language." You know, it's like scroll. <laughs> that was something said, but you were talking about certain people who, even at high doses, don't have any experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen it, but I haven't. So what I mean is, is that I've seen people have tr- uh, tremendous quantities of like very high doses. Right. And not experience anything, right. but right. if they were persistent enough, right. they found what that wall was that needed to be taken down, and with the right shaman or the right medicine, were able to have a breakthrough. And then going back to lower doses experiences, lower dosage experiences of that same medicine that couldn't break through before could yeah. now be very right. profound. So that thinking, door. yeah, exactly. I'm thinking of a specific example of someone who, you know, they hear I, I talk about this, and they said, you know, they were struggling with a lot of different. Um, forms of anxiety, but expressed mm. anxiety, not only internal, but it was creating um, mm. a lot a of physical issues. No physical oh, issues physical. for them, okay. right? Physical in their in their body. It was a, some illness starting to manifest, and um, they were determined to heal it. And had you know tried a number of experiences, and at one point tried a fifteen gram psilocybin experience. Wow. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And they reached out to me, asked me if I had any um, thoughts. And I said, you know, I think that with the right practitioner with ayahuasca, they can probably, mm. Mm. Um, mm. they might be able to get you. I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that happen. That the right ones, you know, someone who, uh, mm. <clears throat> a shaman I know, he says that his job is to, um, he's not using the word overwhelm, but a word similar to that. Like to overwhelm the, fi- the five senses. Or he kind of, you know, like, an ayahuasca experience can have all of that, right? The right. smells, the sounds. Right, it's such a multi. All of that. The overwhelm the five senses so you can access your sixth. Right. Right. Beautiful. So, um, and when he, 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 sure enough, several months later, he did have an ayahuasca experience. He had that breakthrough, whatever it was. That wall was broken down. A difficult experience mm. and, mm. you know, probably still very much in the yeah. very difficult parts right. of, um, of his healing process. But then afterwards went to a two and a half gram psilocybin experience. And, and was able to yeah, um, yeah. touch something. <laughs> right, right. Touch something. So it's very high. interesting because in some ways, you know, one can see the role of a shaman as being almost like a midwife of helping to birth something in a person that's wanting to come out and wanting to break through and open up um, and that they can in various ways facilitate that. It's very interesting. I was very blessed to be trained in a methodology of a facil- facilitating methodology in the corporate work that I, I was involved in. And it's called process work or process oriented psychology um, developed by a Jewish um, Arnold Mandel is his name. He's a, he's a Jungian psychoanalyst and a quantum physicist actually he studied at MIT. And he fused these two domains of the, the concept of the shadow and the unconscious, the mm. unexpressed and un, um, connected parts of, of ourselves as an individual and as a team, a team as a system, as an organism, so to speak, in uh, a world uh, of work, and um, fuse that with this concept uh, in, um, in quantum physics of the field and what sits in the field and what hasn't been expressed. And another name for his um, methodology, which also actually has a great uh, resonance with shamanism, one of the books that he wrote is, is actually around uh, the shamanic um, correlations as well. Um, another name that's given for this methodology is called deep democracy and it's a beautiful term because normal democracy implies the majority voice only Mm -hmm. and deep democracy implies that all voices in the system have value and wisdom and not only that but the voice that is most squashed and marginalized the minority voice in any system has the greatest value and you can see this in so many different dimensions if you look at it in terms of like you know uh, the feminist voice that's been uh, squashed for so long and how now in leadership which was traditionally so patriarchal in its kind of qualities and, and control and power. Now, the research shows that the most powerful, you know, Brene Brown's work and many others, mm-hmm. uh, qualities for effective leaders are vulnerability and authenticity and emotional intelligence and intuition. It's that understated minority voice that is showing just how much wisdom has been squashed for so long. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, some of the research of this woman, Susan Cain, who has a mm-hmm. TED Talk and Introvert. introverts and the power of introverts and that voice that in the West, you know, we've been so seduced by the extrovert 
extrovert voice more and just how much value and wisdom there is in the introvert voice. And then if we take it on an individual microcosmic level of every one of us as a human being, what are the parts of us that we haven't expressed, that we haven't, what are the parts that are hidden, that are understated, that are more subtle, that have not seen the light of day and been uh, you know accessed or, or expressed and birthed and so these healing spaces really and the facilitator i think in a family dynamic you can call that the child as yeah. well as yeah. the child's voice is right. uh, absolutely is paramount and should absolutely should be and if we can to. just learn to learn from our children and 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 hear their voice and and and, and give space for their voice and amplify and, and really you know i really believe that our children are our greatest teachers I, you know we we have the gift of being able to have children if we're blessed with that uh, to be able to uh, reconnect with our, our own child and to to that beautiful quality of just wonder and curiosity and openness and we forget that as we grow up and as we become more adults and we learn how we're supposed to live we shut off so much of that that uh, deeper spiritual uh, mystery inside of ourselves and we need to learn how to reconnect with that there's so much of the inner critic voice and the parental teacher mm. kind of you know right. <laughs> focus is so you know and, and this is really where the research in the uh, positive psychology based on the neuroscience is so powerful because it really shows that well-meaning teachers and parents they're just teaching what they were taught and and learned growing up uh, but the focus is on the negative and the media focuses 98% or more on the negative. And so what happens is our brains start to actually <coughs> become skewed and retain and assume that the unconsciously, automatically, that the correct ratio of negative to positive is like that. And this is where the atomic habits and kind of learning to rewire ourselves in gratitude uh, practice, not just you know thinking positively and trying to have gratitude as an intellectual exercise, but doing acts of gratitude um, will shape uh, re rewire the brain to be able to focus on uh, the more possibilities the openness the there's a guy sean aker is an amazing ted talk um called the happy secret to work or better work or something um and he's one of the you know world leading founders in this positive psychology and he has a very funny quarter of an hour um, hilarious he's like a stand-up comedian talk about this and, and he has this kind of formula of gratitude exercises that we should do you know um every day two minutes it's like write three new things that you're grateful for every day write one thing that you experienced today that was positive amidst all the stresses and challenges when you normally look at your day and you see just the negative and think of one person that is in any of your networks um, who you're grateful for having in your life for whatever reason they make you laugh they inspire you they're always there to and write them a one-line message you know an email or whatsapp to just acknowledge them and thank them and if you think about it when you do those it takes two three minutes a day right like if you get into a practice of actually start and, and doing gratitude that will rewire. So it's like what the science is showing is that as adults, Richard Pascal said it so brilliantly, he said that as adults, we're far more likely to act ourselves into new ways of thinking than think ourselves into new ways of acting. And it sounds counterintuitive to the traditional sort of focus in psychology and coaching, but that's really where the science is showing it's at. And how amazing is it that as a Jew, a Jew means a grateful person. Yehudi comes from Yehuda, which means to thank, <laughs> to da. Yeah. And so... You know, we say modeani, the very first words, the very first word we say is mode, thank. Mm -hmm. It's normally translated as I thank. But if it was I thank as a verb, the grammar would be I need mode in the reverse. Modeani is far more profound. Modeani is saying as an identity, it's a statement of a declaration that mode, a Yehudi, ani is who I am. Because think about it, to thank, to acknowledge, you have to be awake, you have to be present. You cannot acknowledge whether it's a sunset, a loved one, a beautiful piece of music, a poem. You cannot acknowledge anything if you're unaware of it. So thanking means being awake, being observant. That's what an observant Jew to me means, not what level of kosher and what you're wearing on your head or what you, you know, it's how awake are you, how observant are you. So it's the most beautiful thing to understand the meditation of modani how it frames our day it's like the moment we awaken and become aware and observant we frame and state that this is my identity as a jew to be awake and it's it, it's just it's a beautiful hasidic teaching in the rebbe's book hayom yom that says that at the end of modani there's a dot by um it says, Bechemla Rabba Emunatecha. Bechemla is with um, compassion, uh, lo love. Um, Rabba is great, abundant, and Emunatecha is your faith, God, in me. Right. <coughs> you have so much faith in me that you've given me another day in life to help change and, and, and heal the world. So the question is, where does that Rabba adjective, great, abundant, fall? Is the Rabba going on the Emunatecha? Oh, I've always wondered that. Okay. Or is it going yeah. on the Bechemla? 
Yeah. So there's a dot, if you look in the Surah, after Bechemla, to indicate that the rubber is going on your faith, God, in me to give me yeah. another day of life. And the Hasidic teaching that the Rebbe brings in Hayom Yom is that that dot, that humility, that openness of a Jew, which comes from the word hod, to thank is to acknowledge, hod means uh, humility, um, openness, that dot should be the compass of the day. That well, that's also humbled, right? Right. right. Ani modeh means I agree, I, I acknowledge. Right. right. So the, the teaching in Hayom Yom is that the Rebbe brings is that that dot should spread out. The dot of the modiani, that dot of that point of awareness and openness and humility, which is what it means to be a Jew on the most fundamental level, should should spread and, and be the compass of your of your whole day in life. May it be. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I received an email from uh, a woman about a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying that her son um, was act, was struggling a lot with porn and watching mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of porn, a teenager, and she wanted to know if I had any advice um, for him. So my thought process, I don't know what you think about it, is I'll never speak to the, a person about another person. Yeah. Yeah. Like the person who's yeah. come to me is always the person asking for help, right. whether they know it or not. Right. So I, I shared with her two things. I shared with her a podcast um, that I released a few months ago uh, focused on family healing where the healthiest members should heal first, you know, and kind of, mm. Mm. you know, like we're all, it's, it's all kind of it's one unit. Systemic. Yeah. Mm. So start with the healthy instead of saying the mm. unhealthiest. But the other point, uh, the other thing I shared with her was a letter of the Rebbe that was shared with me where he said the family is one unit and at the top is the father and the mother, the Balhabais and the Karasabais. So being that you can always heal something directly or indirectly. And sometimes indirect healing, especially if you incorporate the Balhabais mm -hmm. or the Karasabais, right? The foundation or the head or the head of the house, then a lot of healing can go through the um oh. the uh the whole family. So I shared that with her and I said that I've never seen a child struggling whose parents didn't struggle individually or in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And um she responded back, this wasn't what I was looking for or something like that. Something like that. This wasn't what I was looking for, but I'll think wasn't about it. Wasn't ready to. What? Wasn't ready to take that. <laughs> well, I don't know, but it's like <laughs> that. they sent me a um, a message. But it connected right. for me to to what you were saying about like the deep democracy. Is right. right. The, the question, I don't even know if she had the words, but the feeling in there was like, there's something wrong with my child. Right. As a separate part of the... Right. Yeah, something wrong with my child. Right. Come give me the solution for them. Right. No, there's nothing wrong with your child. There's something wrong with you. Right. right. And the child is... Is the, is, is the, is the, is the mouthpiece. Is really exactly. Just, is a lightning conductor. Yeah, exactly. Letting you know what's... Letting you know. How can there be something yeah. wrong with a child? It's so crazy yeah. to me that... Exactly. It's such a fundamental perspective, you know, in any family system where a child is um, exhibiting symptoms and... and, and uh, a condition that uh, their world is sort of imploding and, and they reaching for help. You know, the, the addiction is the solution, as Gabor uh, often right. says, you know, and to understand that with compassion. Um, and, and that's what's so beautiful, you know, Gabor's technique of compassion and mm. inquiry. And yeah, to, it's beautiful. It's so essential because rather than judging it and trying to quieten the voice, let's listen to it. Let's, you know, in this methodology of deep democracy, it's a, they use a technique from Gestalt psychology, which is creating a wholeness of, of amplification. And, and they will look for what are the subtle moments that are happening in an in, in a interaction, in a team, in a, in a diet, in a conversation, and, 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 and catch those, try and catch those. It's so hard to, because they're, they're sometimes passed by so quickly. Right. But then really amplify that, and, and, and let's listen to that, and let's learn from that. And what is this voice here to show us? And in my body, what's coming up, and what am I experiencing? And Western medicine and healing is so much about killing symptoms. You know, it's pain numbing, right. pain surgery, taking away the pain, physical pain numbing, emotional pain numbing. But what about understanding that that's just a communication? And how do we listen to that? And how and real healing comes, I believe, from this whole different uh, approach, which is really where a lot of this research is kind of going in the direction of paying attention to the body and working with the body and understanding in a compassionate way rather than trying to shut off and shut down. Right. For me, there's been, you know, there's been this realization that when I'm sitting with someone, if they're struggling with something, it's... Um, and not professionally, I don't speak to people in that capacity. It's so I have much more leeway. There's no license that I. Uh, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <after that. laughs> Keep going, <laughs> brother. <laughs> but the question always is like when I'm seeing something, like obviously there's something wrong, right? <laughs> but not what's wrong with the behavior, what's right with it. And anything, I, it's right. like with literally anything. So whether right. it's a child, 
raging right. or someone drugging or whatever right. it is that's happening right. is right. understanding what is right with yeah. that thing is most likely to answer the question of how we solve whatever problem it is Absolutely. we want to solve. It's a reframe. I mean, in neurolinguistic programming, they use that that kind of technique as well in terms of all behavior is is has a positive intention. And if we understand that and try and understand the model of where the person is coming from and what's happening and being expressed, it's so much more useful way to to understand you know, the reprogramming, the programming, and how to reprogram and how to allow a different sort of software um, to be put in place. Right. To use a metaphor. So I like what you've done in this conversation, where you've explained how certain norms, especially within healing and and some others globally, politically, are kind of flipping on its head. Yeah. But how yeah. that's kind of part of the same process a death and a, a rebirth, which Absolutely. is perfect for for medicine because that is right. That's the space. You know, yeah. When I say DMT is excreted most during excreted most during the the, the moment before death and birth. Right. So it has those right. those qualities. Such a mystical of, thing, that quality. I mean, yeah. it's just so fascinating to beginning and end of life and the circular kind of pineal in Hebrew means the face of God. And you look at Pinay Kel as uh, the part in the Torah where Yaakov has dreams and encounters and it's just it's opposite the Luz bone. There's, uh, there's an amazing rabbi who recently passed, Rabbi Joel Buxt who was an uh, expert in uh, the Vilna Gaon's Kabbalah, who wrote a lot about that. He was had experiences with ayahuasca and wrote, uh, I think it's called The Jerusalem Stone. It's a fascinating book. Really, a lot about that as well. Um, so, yeah, it's just so fascinating to see. There's something happening. There's, something oh, that, there's no doubt. Yeah, and there's a lot of this DMT running through a lot of people's veins right, right. now, much more than... Right. <laughs> DMT, <laughs> deep, meaningful Torah. <laughs> 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 have you heard this teaching? I, I don't know the source for it, but someone uh, once mentioned it to me. It may have been a podcast, may, may have not been, um, that King Solomon recognized that a lot of his wisdom and gifts would not be able to be preserved by the Jewish people. Wow. And he gave it to others. Wow. And... I, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying I heard this from yeah. someone. I don't know the, yeah, the source for it. So yeah. you have I'm not heard. familiar with it, but it's that's just really interesting to hear. Yeah. yeah. So if someone knows the source and is yeah. you know listening this far into this conversation, yeah, please hit us up. I'd, yeah, I'd love <laughs> to know it. But it sounded fascinating to me, and it feels so resonant because uh, there's been a lot for me within my own Judaism. This was not a process to reconnect with it at all, but it's just been um, right. It's been impossible not to right, and not even from a place, you know of the truth of Judaism versus other religions, something that transcends mm. way beyond that. Mm. It's the, a part of it that this is me, mm. right? This is like, this is a heritage. This is right. my people. This right. is, you know, my way of, 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 of being that. Even this whole idea of chosen versus not chosen yeah. to me, yeah. like we'd have to, yeah, that's, everything that's, is chosen. Yeah. There's not a single thing extra. Absolutely. If there's the any universe. religion that doesn't say that we the way and we the only, and uh, it's Judaism, we, we don't convert, we don't seek to convert, we believe right. in the infinity of God and beauty is expressed in the fact that there's so many multiple paths to reach him, her, it, uh, right. you know, and uh, to limit that and say there's only one way is like placing, you know, our human limitations on God. We create God in our image. Right. You know, we return the favor. It's yeah. like, you know, Ralph Cook, the great Ralph Cook had the most incredible teaching, which I love so much on this topic. I'm interrupting you yeah, as well. Know but uh, he says, based, based on a Kabbalistic principle, that everything that exists has a divine spark which is the soul of that mm-hmm. thing or entity without sure. which it can't exist. So if the movement of atheism came about and exists, there's got to be a divine purpose and spark <coughs> in atheism. Now, what a question. Right. What's the divine purpose in atheism? Oh, good. Right? And listen to what he says. I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, atheism came to help us wash clean the diminished perception of the grandeur of the divine. Say that again. Atheism came about saying there's no God, there's not, to help us wash clean and start afresh again the diminished perception of the grandeur of the oh. divine. Yeah, similar to what the Hasidic master says, that the God you don't believe in, I don't believe, I don't in, believe in either. Correct. Right. Correct. So we have to kind of go through times of revisiting what is, what is, what is God for me? What is the divine? What, you know, what, what pictures and images am I carrying still from my kindergarten days and from you know, media or kind of you know, uh, Christian or, or, or other kind of overlays in society that sort of trickle through? And not that I have any disrespect for Christian, you know, but it's amazing how when you get to the, the, the mystical layer of you know, uh, teachings on the Christian mystic side and Master Eckhart and mm. uh, the Sufi teachings in Islam, the mystical teachings, the incredible rich teachings in Sufism, um, and the Jewish Kabbalah and the Hindu, there's such just overlap mm-hmm. and 
really talking about the same. It's just incredible. I mean, we've got amazing historical evidence of um, of amazing interaction and cross pollination between the Kabbalistic masters and the Sufi masters. Mm -hmm, yeah, a tremendous amount. Rambam's son, and there's just such a fascinating, you know. And the Sufis brought such a focus of movements. You know, the word in dervishes, movement and and um, uh, breath and sound and you know, in, in just such an incredibly uh, beautiful way as well. So I think there's an amazing book called Anatomy of the S of the Spirit, I think it's called, um, by this Caroline Miss. She's a medical intuitive, and she actually overlays the fascinating I mean, medical intuitive in the sense that she's able to intuit things about people in their body that's been verified by you know measuring mm -hmm. technologies in, in Western medicine. And she's one of the best, and, and uh, wrote this book. <laughs> and it, she really speaks about how we have these archetypes, these sephiris, really, um, these centers of power. You know, she calls it, where if there's blockages in any of them and what they symbolically mean and represent, it will manifest in the corresponding physical elements and conditions. And she, in her book, Anatomy of the Spirit, I believe it's called, um, she overlays and integrates the seven spheres of the Kabbalah with the seven chakras in the Eastern traditions with the seven sacraments in Christian mysticism. And it's just it's fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it really resonates in terms of what you're saying in terms of just being able to really connect with and reach out into that broader, you know, less limited viewpoint. And, uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, part of the process, one of the gifts, mm. to speak. Mm. You know, you mentioned earlier about you quote Gabor Mate a few times. So, you know, he was someone who healed a lot of drug addicts. So someone asked right. him the question, how are you referring people to another drug, right. ayahuasca? Right. Calling it the, uh, Gabor referred to it as the number one treatment for addicts. Right. So it's not another drug, and he said it's actually the opposite right. of, a, Correct. of a drug. Correct. Well, it's, if you think about that, any addiction, drug or substance or other, is really um, finding some solution, in inverted commas, uh, on the outside to fill that void and, and emptiness and disconnection on the inside um, and, and to fill temporarily and not in a sustainable, real, enriched way. And therefore, it's a bottomless pit. It's never going to be because you yeah, just... It's an using, escape of sorts. Uh, correct. It's an escape and an avoidance of the very stuff you actually need to face and look at and work on internally. Well, the psychedelic medication, besides the fact that it can never be addictive just because they don't work when you take them every day, you know, you need to wait at least a week, preferably two, three, between MDMA um, doses and psilocybin doses. Besides, it's the last thing that you want to repeat in a hurry. <laughs> but that's the opposite whole direction you you're being flung head first right, exactly. into the deepest cobwebs of your psyche exactly. and the stuff that you're normally avoiding in addiction pathology so it's very much an antidote it really is the complete opposite direction so it makes sense that these would be very powerful tools and, right. the know. analogy i've given is it's uh, one is sleeping with a prostitute one is sleeping with your wife yeah that's right. a great analogy so it's uh, same act yeah Right? right there's some similarities for sure right but right. they couldn't be more different couldn't be more different yeah. couldn't be more different. absolutely it's a beautiful metaphor in hasidic teachings i believe the alter Rebbe brings it uh, founder of the chabad uh, dynasty uh, we recently had the rebbe's your site in fact it was so very resonant and meaningful for me to be at the psychedelic conference and connecting with other jews in such special ways on gimel tamas the rebbe's oh, right. site and singing some of the niguna with my balls on that uh, <laughs> on that date but um it's really um Oh, I've lost my train of thought now. Where was I before there? Um, we're talking about connection and disconnection and uh, escaping. Oh, with, um, escaping with drugs versus connecting with uh, psychedelics. Yes, yes. Um, hmm. That's so funny. Okay, well, if, if it's important Listen, to come back, yeah. it, will, it will pop back into my consciousness. You know, something you were saying about the uh, Vilna Gaon. Uh, so it's a story. I do, again, I don't know the source for this one, but it's mm. one I repeat um, often because I enjoy it. So the someone went to the, the Baal Shem Tov taught his students that every single sin has a oh, I remember that. a way of doing it. Oh, so go to it. Ah, sorry, I just yeah. popped that kid. When you don't think about it, it yeah. comes. Um, so the, the the metaphor in Hasidic teachings is the Alter Rebbe. That's where I got to the Rebbe and the dynasty. Yeah. Um, it, he gives a metaphor of when you said that it could, it couldn't, it's the same app, but it couldn't be more, more far more apart. Different, right. So one of the um, uh, metaphors that the Alter Rebbe gives with Teshuvah 
it's so beautiful because we can shiva means come back to return to return to our divine essence to return to god but how can we ever be away from god I mean, god is yeah. everywhere all the time omnipresent you know how my karma fills the space it's um so the metaphor that's given it's such a beautiful metaphor and powerful metaphor is you can have two people standing right next to each other but back to back and Chuva is just simply the process of just turning around and reconnecting and, and having resonance and having... So I can be alienated. I can be right next to someone. I can be involved in an act where I'm trying to seek an addiction for a connection, a closeness to, for the divine in such a misguided way. But I can just turn around and flip and kind of approach that from a different way in a more connected, authentic way. And it can just open up that whole you know, different level of... Right. Of, of healing and, and connection. Right. In many ways, this kind of sums up uh, what feels to me like your message. Yeah. Is that we're, we're so close, right? But right. we're looking the wrong way for the solutions. Right. Let's turn it towards. We have over. this. Yes. Yeah, the journey so is We within. have this. Yeah. We have, we have the answer. We have the healing. This idea right. of um, chemical imbalance, mm. it's, which, which you alluded to at the beginning of the conversation, it's so, like the, the language is so subtle, but the suggestion is, that there's something wrong. wrong with that person, almost as if they were born this way. Right. That needs to be fixed. Right. And, you know, I've yet to meet someone in, I was in 12 step meetings for a very long time. I've yet to meet someone without a story. Right. This addictive gene, I don't know what the addictive gene is. It's possible there's a setup for it. Right. But that setup needed a good story of trauma. Right. A good story of trauma in order to, in order to get someone to that place of, uh, of addiction. It's been in every case. And you'll find, yes, there are some people who are more sensitive than others, but I've always found that when a situation is really severe, there is a story that's mm -hmm. kind of equally severe. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a, a guy, and sometimes, you know, it's not in the conscious memory, but there was one guy who uh, I befriended who was suicidal, but it just he couldn't, he couldn't pin it on anything. Why was he feeling mm. this way? Why did, mm. he, and that turned into an additional baton to beat himself up with. Right. Nothing even happened to me. It wasn't as, I was, right. as if I was sexually abused or my parents right. were divorced or I grew right. up in intense poverty, right. poverty or, right. you know, I don't have any story that I know of. And <clears throat> he grew up very Hasidic in a large family. And uh, at this point, he wasn't any longer. He was very detached from it. And eventually he, um, you know, he did a uh, psilocybin experience. And during that, he had a vision of himself crying in his crib mm. and his mom putting a pillow over his head to silence him. <sighs> and there was something to me which was very symbolic about what he was struggling with because I felt that from him is how difficult it was for him to ask for help, how Express difficult it was for him reach to out. reach out. You know, it had to get to this point of, you know, virtually planning his suicide to even say, wow. like, okay, I'm ready to do something about it. To help and, him actually connect. What? Ultimately. Yeah, and to, ha to have that experience. And I don't think he's out of the struggle. I don't, I, I, yeah. I don't think he's, he's there yet. But just you can see someone. He's like, why is he struggling so much? Why is he feeling this way? And there isn't any answer. He can't even give you an answer. Mm. But eventually when he went in, mm. he found an answer. And whether that was a real memory or symbolic of something that... Right, um, represented. That, right, which sometimes could happen in, in psychedelic, psychedelic right. experiences. Oh, it was obviously memory. something really, really there that he experienced as a child. Like that feeling of being suffocated by the person who's meant to care for him the most mm. was a real and true mm. uh, feeling. And it made sense for him the way he wow. felt now about his parents. So, mm. you know, this idea of chemical imbalance. Yeah. Um, it's the wrong, what? It's, it's the wrong narrative. It's, it's, it's disempowering. Yeah, very, yeah. very. So and that's that what the idea. research is now showing as well, which is really incredible too. And I guess that's the sad reality, but also the, um, the nice thing is that the sad reality is that we need tools like this to turn inward. That's the sad reality, but we do. So we, uh, yeah. so we use them and leverage them. Yeah. Well, why don't we end with, uh, you brought some of these tools for a reason. Yeah. You set them out here. So My toys. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah, let me, uh, I've got some water there to show as well, just now Mira, in the singing bowl. So I'll start off with one of my favorite singing bowls that, that I found, or I should say found me, or we found each other. Um, this is uh, these singing bowls are just absolute magical uh, instruments. You know the how the Tibetans they're from Tibet from the monks they've been uh, uh, hand beaten. You can see and there's different mm -hmm. metal alloys. If you look at uh, um, that one over there, I'll just um, yeah, you can grab, grab, it. grab it. You can see that quite different constituents 
in, of the metal. So you've got nickel, brass, yeah. copper, different kinds of um, metal alloys that they use, but they hand beat them and the walls are hollow. So the sound really comes uh, out of the walls. So I'll just show you. If we leave this in a soundproof room, this will continue resonating, vibrating and, and singing for up to three minutes. Yeah. If, as soon as you touch the walls, stops because the walls are where, where the sound comes from. So you hold the singing bowls normally at the bottom and it creates this incredible vibration, very somatic connecting and you feel it. Many people describe feeling it in their bones. Um, it makes a lot of sense what's happening on a cellular level, which I'll show you when we put the water in the bowl just now. Um, easier to first play it without the water and it's heavier and, and then I'll show the water uh, demonstration. But um, yeah, these are, are really, really special instruments that I encountered in the medicine space and that uh, really I connected with so powerfully. <coughs> and um, this is an overtone instrument. So an overtone is an acoustic phenomenon. You can do it with some instruments, with piano, with guitar, with the voice, the didgeridoo, which is that like... Um, <laughs> and you can do it as you hear with the, with the voice as well. So an overtone, let me just demonstrate what an overtone is. So if I use this bowl, it's easier. It's more accentuated. So... There's two notes at the same time. I'm going to sing them. The lower one is oh, and the high one is e. Now I'll show you if I use the wooden part of this mallet, it's, it, it, it isolates just the higher one. Listen. Right? Mm -hmm. Now when I use the felt covered part, you've got the lower and the high one together. And that creates the oscillation wave like ooh, 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 sort of resonating uh, sound. Um, very mystical in some ways. It's like a figure of eight dance between two tones. So an overtone, you have a fundamental tone and then you have a higher tone um, that, that sort of sings above it. And all of them do that. So yeah, all of, all of the singing bowls have that kind of uh, overtone frequency. Um, and it's really nice, you know, what I have discovered and what I enjoy doing uh, is, is singing um, on top of a, a singing bowl with my voice and using some overtone as well. So I'll demonstrate some of those, some of the deeper um, th throat uh, techniques used by uh, the Mongolians, the Tuvians, the Tibetans as well, even some African tribes. And also. Are they using it for healing? Are they using it for music? So uh, yeah, they're using it for music, for the meditation, for in their sacred kind of context okay. and traditional tribal. Um, yeah, um, it actually... Uh, it brings to mind a moment when I mentioned the South African tribes. Uh, there was a wonderful, magical, mysterious moment in the conference where uh, probably one of the most mysterious moments where I happened to be standing in the storm next to a black American woman who shared with me that she's trained as a traditional healer in the Zulu tradition, uh -huh. one of the tribes of South Africa. And it was just such a beautiful moment. But yeah, so I'll share some of those tones, uh, the bass ones, the medium frequency ones and um, higher frequency vocal ones on top of the bowl. And then I'll sing maybe a very brief uh, Hasidic nigun, which is quite powerful on top as well, uh, one of the Rebbe's favorite niggins from the Alta Rebbe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Beautiful. Thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'll just quickly show you where the water may be. Mm -hmm. It's just a powerful demonstration to think about we 70% plus water as human beings. Never mind the chakra and the meridians and the metaphysical you know, energy systems and how these things are well, on that level. Uh, the level right? right, what could be going on what inside us? So it's very powerful to show that to people and to then bear some of these that in mind. Uh, the whole s space and field of, of sound healing now. Mm -hmm. Uh, where yeah, it's very big in the States and in Europe where you go to someone, a, a sound healer, and they've got bowls and didgeridoos and all these other instruments and you lie down on a bed and you have a sound bath, a sound yeah. immersive kind of, you know, and so it's just such a fascinating, again, just mysterious connection between sound and vibration affecting us on the body and on an internal level and how that impacts us. And so uh, in these healing spaces, these things are especially effective and powerful yeah i attended one a couple of months ago and uh, they said that the next week which i wasn't able to go to they had one where you're in hammocks mm. so you kind of get this around the, wow. the surround sounds yeah. so to speak right? yeah it's really it's really a <laughs> special experience so yeah when you play awesome. multiple balls at the same time they also really um have such a unique i'll just give a little taste of that just hear that resonance you know so it's you like, lead these type of ceremonies right yeah so I, I i work with sound meditation sound uh, um, journeys a lot uh, and, and i offer that sometimes in the corporate space when i'm teaching mindfulness and mindfulness-based techniques and and tools it's there's such a unique you know when you do a normal mindfulness meditation a visualization using your breath and that it's sometimes when someone is using that their, their verbal you know induction technique it's hard because it's still operating on a, on a right. on a mental level and to just have the quiet and declutter whereas this it's just instantaneously if you close your eyes and you set it up right mm. within seconds it just immediately bypasses that rational mind and takes people into their emotional into their body spaces so i mean the application of these things is just, just so vast that can be used to just relax to ground to meditate to use as a mindfulness um, experience and process and and uh, practice and you know on the on the healing and kind of more consciousness mm. uh, levels so they, they're really uh, amazing in their utility and application Awesome. I'm yeah. glad we met. I think it was Avrami Garari who put us in touch. Yes, I have yeah. to thank Avrami so grateful to, uh, for that connection. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been so wonderful to, to be here. Thank you for, yeah, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks the for invitation the trip and, and the time. And it's uh, just very special to connect. Yeah. I'm sure we'll do it again. Thank you. Look forward. Thank you. <laughs> Next team. Next conference. As well. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Eddie.